This is a previously recorded episode of the IT in the D show. IT in the D, networking Detroit, one beer at a time. IT in the D.com. And welcome. We are live at Secure World Detroit, hanging out in the uh, beautiful Ford Auditorium here in Dearborn, Michigan. This is the IT in the D show. This is Bob the Sales Guy hanging out with Dave the Geek. Check us out online, IT in the D dot com. And uh, yeah, we're sitting here on the trade show floor. It's a cute world, and I, I must admit, this is a lot bigger than I anticipated. And it's, and it's a room full of my people. <laughs> well, and a lot of your people. Right. A lot it's, of sales people. It's walk in and turn off your phone if you're a sales guy because there's a hacker <laughs> probably looking at it right now. Um, but hey, we got really lucky. We wrangled in an old friend of ours. We got Steve Fox here, who's the Senior Cybersecurity Officer at a federal agency that shall not be named. But Steve, good seeing you again. Thanks for hanging out with us. Great to see you guys. Uh, glad to see you guys at such a cool conference here in Detroit. It's good to see uh, security people getting together. It's a very small community. It's a real pleasure when people come together to talk, talk about the latest uh, issues and challenges. Yeah, so I mean, these are these are your people. I mean, are you guys talking shop? Are you guys talking everything but? Are you guys getting in the weeds? What's, uh, what's, what are some of the conversations going on? Well, I'm hearing a lot more about privacy and how it impacts security because it's really two sides of the same issue if you think about it. Because when we uh, secure things, we're worried about how we're going to be building controls around keeping people away from things and using it correctly. Well, the using it part is where privacy comes in. How do we control the way information is used while protecting people's information in terms of PHI, in terms of uh, who you, who has access to it, and, who, and the way it's utilized? Well, and especially you know in today's world where everybody you know you've got you know Sergio walking into. You know, Chrysler, here's my iPhone, make it work. You know, it's a BYOD world. Yeah. You know, so I mean, like, how, how are, how are, you know, whether it's, you know, where you are or other, like, how are companies facing that kind of challenge? Because, I mean, it is, a, you know, okay, well, I mean, we're in the world now where, you know, DevOps is the big thing. You know, marketing wants to get a site launched. IT says, oh, it's going to take us four months to stand up servers. Really, here's my corporate Amex, and now I've got my site out on the Amazon cloud, and life's good. That's got to make security guys nervous because, well, they obviously want that Amazon cloud service talking to data somewhere. Well, it's interesting you should bring in that. So the the guys over at OWASP, the same people yeah. that came up with the top 10 controls for security, for, for, for web security, they're also doing a privacy version of that. So they're leveraging the ideas of web security design into designing uh, privacy controls around that security. So they're, they're, they're helping... Pe- Security people and developers understand, well, how do I develop a private and secure application? Well, and that was one of the things that OWASP was really good for, was, I mean, at least making people aware of, I I guess let's call them fundamentals. Like, you know, here are your, you know, if nothing else, doing this will keep you relatively secure. Right. You know, and so, I mean, they're taking that same approach then with privacy. For sure. And a lot of the sessions today talk about, well, what are some of the privacy issues we need to worry about? What is a legal environment around that? And what is the things that security practitioners should look at in the next year as far as our focus areas for joining that technical side of security environment while considering the privacy aspects of it? So for those folks that couldn't make it, you know, whether, you know, because they're, you know, couldn't be here, they're out of town, whatever, I mean, I guess from, you know, whether it's your perspective or the perspectives that you've been hearing in here, like, I guess, what are, like, maybe the top one or two things that people need to have kind of eyes forward on, you know, that are kind of, that are going to be coming down the pipe in this next year as a, I mean, it, it seems like there's always something new coming, and, and it's, you know, there's always somebody sitting behind the scenes going, told you. <laughs> well, from the practitioner side, definitely the, the OWASP privacy project has been a huge topic of uh, discussion today. So go out to Google, type in OWASP privacy project, and read about that there. That's really the uh, where the rubber meets the road type stuff. For the management level guys, start looking at privacy by design, which is something that was done during the mid-90s by some Canadian researchers, okay. but is now hitting the, the forefront. And at the more the strategy side, start looking at the the European Privacy Directive, Data Protection Privacy Directive, 
because that's going to impact the way the international commerce is done and the privacy regulations around protecting information going across between the U.S. and the European Union. Oh, I'd agree. I mean, so like, you know, basically the EU is to the global internet economy what California is to the United States. Correct. <laughs> and uh, a while back when the big privacy thing, the big privacy uh, issues came to the to the attention in terms of breach and uh, information was, that was being shared by the federal government, the European Union wouldn't trust us anymore. They just couldn't deal with right. bu buying, say, Microsoft. There were there were actually voices within the EU that were saying, okay, we're going to create a European internet. We're going to cut ourselves from the internet altogether and just be that. Well, that wasn't going to work. Right. And we're going to forget about international commerce. We're just going to be our own isolated nation state, essentially. Well, no one's, no one's really going to do that. And that's what led to the work on the EU Data Protection and Privacy Directive, which is now in its implementation argument phase. And there, there's some hold at Germany and a couple of other states are figuring out, well, how, how do we actually make this happen? Right. But uh, I would say we're about three months away from fully implementing the new regulations. So now when you say implementing regulations, like, I mean, so, you know, a new law gets passed. I mean, look how long it takes, you know, companies to roll out, you know, new state, federal, whatever, tax codes, that kind of stuff that come down the pipe. You know, so, I mean, how, how, does, an, how does something like that getting implemented affect John the Coder? You know, sitting at a company here that's in the United great, States. That's a great question. Like, well, like, what? How painful is that going to be, and when's that pain coming? Okay, so the first place is going to be hit are people like management at, at General Motors. People that do international business because all of a sudden, uh, Safe Harbor, which is like the right? the main thing that allows us to do business in Europe, is now going to change. It's going to be tougher to get. It'll be tougher to show that we're being compliant. Well, the way that filters down to coders and application designers and security practitioners is now we have to supply more validation to management that, yes, we're doing what these new regulations and control requirements allow, are telling us to do. Yeah, here's our assurances. Here's our audit right. results. Now yep. we have more oversight and more to worry about. And the EU has a lot more tight controls around privacy than the U.S. does. And what that goes back to is America grew out of a commercial state, uh, a com commercial approach to doing, doing regulations. Yep. Everything was around opportunity and furthering business goals. Europe, on the other hand, came out of a tradition of being ruled from the moment you're born yeah. by kings and potentates. So their entire idea around privacy starts as a function of the individual, not as a function of commerce. So they protect the individual from the moment they're born. Privacy is a right, not something you can sell. Whereas in, in, the, in America, we can sell our privacy. Well, and people do every day. Right. You know, they, they, I always laugh. You know, whenever somebody whines about you know the latest little Facebook, you know, change their layout or anything like that, I'm like, okay, if you're not paying for a service, you kind of are the service, and you realize that everything you're giving them for free, they have right. you know rights well, and access. And all, it's yeah. It's the Kroger coupon card. It's like you, right. you fill out. It's that's the, that was the most brilliant way for them to get your demographic information and to keep in touch with you, giving you a damn coupon every time you went shopping. Right now they own you. They own your name. Well, it's like what we said, you know, don't you dare track me, but, you know, damn you if you try to take away my GPS. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to find my Google Maps, but don't you dare track me. So if, if your listeners are at all worried about either the strategy side of, of privacy and how it connects with security, or even someone that works in a company that does international business, I really recommend you come to day two of the session because there'll be a lot of sessions, especially for practitioners, of what they need to start doing to address privacy. So was today more of the, like, you know, high-level theory structure, yes. that's, and then tomorrow's the more, more practical hands-on? Hands okay, interesting. 
So yeah, I actually I ran into somebody that just came out of a session, and they just looked at me straight in the face and said, "I think I'm going to move to the desert." And I'm like, "What?" He goes, <laughs> he goes "Well, if you look at like from a, from a world of an IoT perspective, we're connecting everything from our thermostats to our cars to every, you know, I mean, the phone was the basic one, but that started there." Oh, I mean, yeah. Talk about IoT. If you read uh, Mark's last research on baby monitors, sure, sure. I mean, that was huge. No, no question. I mean, is, is that a security guy? Is, do, you, do you salivate at that thought, or do you, are you scared? You keep, does that keep you up at night? Well, so, I mean, you, so, so my, my wife and I are, are tr- trying to adopt right now. Okay. And after reading, reading Mark's research, I was shocked. I would think that companies that sell baby monitors would be more, more worried about parental privacy. No question, are. and that was—I mean, if you—if you see, like, there's the, you know the, the trolls of the world. There's the people who are uh, people are rotten to the core. The people that break into these these baby monitors or scream at parents in the middle of the night. It's like, are you right. kidding me? You can't mess with someone else or get on a message forum and troll. You got to do that, really. You know, but yeah, yeah it's, it's it, one of those it, things it's where it's not a righteous thing. Um, no, no. Of all things, you could be doing that's funny. That's yeah. not. You know, it's bad enough that those mothers don't sleep as it is, and right now you got to mess with their heads. Um, but yeah, it's a huge problem, and it's something I don't think those companies even thought of that when they put something like that out. They just said, "Hey, you know." Well, that that, that goes back to the idea that again, back in the nineties, the, the researchers in Canada came up with privacy by design. One of the high level ideas for designing applications and products to address privacy, not from a reactive perspective, from a proactive perspective. We're going to design this app to reduce the probability of any issues even happening. Sure. But, I mean, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier with, like, how do you take away the human element? Because, again, they make yeah. it so enticing for you to give up your info um, freely because you're getting a free candy bar or, you, you know, you get your your special maps or all the applications that you, you uh, have geo-tracking and whatnot attached to you. How do you get the users away from it? Well, that's a great segue because my, my wife, Jen Fox, she won the DEF CON social engineering contest. Awesome. And she was she found badges, like actual employee badges at this uh, company that she was her, was her target. And she was able to use that as part of her reconnaissance to uh, act as though she was part of the vendor validation team member. And she was calling different stores to say, hey, I'm just calling to validate you, that you're getting everything that you need from our vendors. And she knew their culture. She knew how they did things. She knew what kind of swag the company had. She knew all those processes and all the stuff was available on the internet. That's hilarious. Yeah, it's, well, and it's scary. Not hilarious. It's scary. I mean, we were talking to the, at security B sides in Converge. We were talking to a guy that walks into banks and plugs in Ethernet into data centers, and just says he puts he has a logo that says your computer company. And no one questions it. it it's, it's mind-boggling. Oh, yeah. And to be honest, I wouldn't question it either. If somebody, you know how many times I've trailed into an office and no one's even said a word? I mean, you think about that. I, you know, who wants to be that guy that yells at someone in an office, right? Well, the, 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 the thing is, I don't believe that users are stupid. I think users get used to certain things. Yeah. And if you know what they expect, it's very hard to break out of what you expect to see. And part of what I see as a, as a security professional is we need to understand, okay, what do users expect and how do we disrupt that? How do we help them notice what they need to notice? Because if we walk in there assuming that the user is stupid, we've already altered our perception and relationship yeah. with the user. Yeah. yeah. We need to take the... It's on us. We're the ones that have to get them. They don't think, sorry, they don't need to get us. Well, from a security standpoint, they might be, right? They might be brilliant in accounting, yeah. but in cybersecurity, they might be, quote-unquote, stupid. You know, well, it's they might be uninformed. Un- un- right, okay, yeah. it's fine. Nice nice choice of phrasing. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, no, I, I run into this problem with Dave all the time, me being what I do. To Dave, I'm, I'm a complete idiot when it comes to his stuff, right? But to, to the guys that don't do what I do for a living, I'm well, I all know what, you know. So what's making the company money? Accounting or security? Right. Neither. So, you know, will, so in, in, in my federal agency, it is the, the politics of the organization and the mission of our organization to provide services to our target market. Yeah. 
it's not the security side. Well, security simply is there to further the goals of the company and to comply with the regulations. That's all it's there for. To break it down into layman's terms, I mean, if you look at, if you talk to like, you know, explain it to me like I'm five or explain it to my father, right? I would say it's just like your house. Yeah. Some people get a lock on the door and that's it. Some people get bars on the windows. Some people get a dog. Some people get a gun. Some people get a uh, movie. Uh, yeah, alarm sorry, systems. Cameras, yeah. alarm systems, right? right? It really depends on, you know, you're taking a risk. Every day you're taking that risk. If you leave your door unlocked, someone might be breaking your house. And then, you know, it's, it's really up to you on how you want to uh, position that. So. You want to? Oh. No, I, I was just, I was completely agreeing. I mean, it's, <laughs> sorry, I got sidetracked. Somebody I used to work with walked by. Um, no, I, I guess, let's see, where do we segue from there? We went IoT. We went regulations. Um, how about the event itself? There's a lot of people here. Yeah, yeah, it's a ton of, it's a ton of people. And there's a lot, a lot of vendors here, and the way I approach vendors is they all solve one particular problem. Right. And what I would love to see is a bash the vendor panel. And what I mean there isn't to be mean, but it would be to put all the vendors up there and ask, okay, what is it that you do? And make it a no platitude zone. Actually, tell right. me what actually matters. And if you say a planet, you drop the panel. <laughs> That'd be awesome. So none of their sales guys would be up there. They're all screwed. <laughs> yeah. you know, if, if we did a no planet two tone, here it's a car world. Right. That'd be the, the most awesome panel in the world. It actually really would be. Well, and it's, and it's one of those, I mean, to your point, yeah, I mean, a lot of them do one thing and do it really well. I mean, it's, right. but, you know, kind of continue. I mean, it's it's the toolbox. And well, then you, know, you, need, you need a screwdriver, yeah. but a screwdriver doesn't solve all your problems, right. so you need a hammer. But you don't have the stamp-on tool guy here to put it all together. Right. But it would be nice to see someone that brings in the firewall, the IDS, IPS, the SDIM, yep. all the management, the layering, and all that that goes with it, and, and you, they're not here, right? And what, what, what I would see is... Coming out of the survivors of the panel, the guys that actually stayed there, is they were start talking about, okay, you need to take care of this piece. We offer a complementary service. You would learn, okay, if I combine these vendors together, I accomplish my goals for sure. my company. And that'd be a lot more informative than any individual sales pitch. Sort of a Thunderdome, but with, like, no death at the end. Just goodness. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> Two vendors enter, one vendor leave. <laughs> <laughs> it would be incredible just to, to get people more engaged with the vendors. Because walking around, I, I can walk around and it's like, oh, this, this vendor has cool swag. That's the first thing I see. That's what everybody sees. It's trick-or-treating. Yeah. But... Do you know what that vendor does? Do you know the problem space they're in? You know, and the cookies and, are delicious. Yeah. But well, <laughs> and will you remember what that vendor does when you've got their bag at home? But if you have a uh, a a com- competitive panel where you're actually sharing in a productive way what it is you do and what your problem space is, that would help the audience know more about the panels, the individual of, uh, vendors. No, it really would. All right, well, hey, uh, thanks for coming on. I mean, anything else you want to touch on before we break? Uh, no, all set. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks all for joining us, Stephen. Thanks, thanks to you again, man. Right. Always a pleasure seeing you. This is the IT Video Show live from Secure World Detroit, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be back in a minute. This is a previously recorded episode of the IT in the D Show. IT in the D. Networking Detroit. One beer at a time. IT in the D dot com. All right, so Stephen went off and found Jennifer, uh, who apparently, uh, very, uh, you know what, I will snap a picture of that Do quickly, it. Yeah, uh, it. apparently went to DEF CON and, and blew everybody out of the water by winning the social engineering competition that was going on. Yes. And so Stephen was going to use a little rundown on that. So, uh, all right, so talk to me. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, if there's a listener of ours that isn't familiar with DEF CON, screw them. Uh, <laughs> But so what's, what's, the, what's the social engineering contest, and, and, and what, what, what was involved? So the social engineering contest, this was its sixth year, and it's done to help raise, raise awareness of the, the potential. And they're doing that without a 5K or anything like without, that? Without, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no ribbons. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, so this is my third year, and this was about seven weeks of effort on my part. So um, as a contestant... 
uh, hundreds of people applied, 14 were selected, we had to do a video submission. When it was time to start, I got received a, a dossier that only had the name of the, the company and their u- main URL. Okay. This year, the theme was uh, telecommunications companies. Okay. And uh, so I had three weeks to do open source research. So basically, looking around on the internet, and uh, I needed to find 29 pieces of information. Okay. And that ranged from some technical stuff, like what's your operating system? Do you have antivirus? The, uh, what versions of Now, of from a things. corporate perspective, or like you had to hunt down an individual user? From a corporate perspective, okay. yep, yep. And uh, also other kind of information that could be used for other kinds of pretexts, like do you have a cafeteria on site? Who is your pest control? Um, when was the last time you had social or, or uh, security awareness training? Okay. So there's a whole range of pieces of information, and everyone has to find the same stuff. So uh, we got three weeks to do our research, write a report, turn it in, and then from turning in the report to actually being at DEF CON for the, co- the exciting part of the competition, I had four weeks, so I worked on a script to figure out how I was going to elicit all this information over the phone, because when we get to DEF CON, uh, you get into a soundproof-ish booth, it's on a stage in front of a room that has probably 350 people in it, and you do calls live to your target company, and everyone in the room can hear both sides of the call. Okay. So you're on the, the hot seat. The preparation is a huge part of it, and some of it's luck because the phone rings. I mean, you it all depends who it. Yeah. You don't know who you're going to get. Some people are forthcoming with information, and some people are really tough. Yeah. Some places have some good procedures built in to help people yeah. respond well, and some don't. Uh, and I happen to find people who were super helpful. And, and are uh, probably looking for a new job right? as, as we speak. I mean, but are they, though? I mean, if you don't train them properly, yeah. you know what I mean? It's yeah. not really their fault. No, and, and so... They're I'm, trained to be friendly and give customer service, so I mean... That's, exact, that's exactly right. And I ended up calling retail locations, partly because I had a Saturday call time. And that's really my my main observation. So you have 25 minutes. Okay. Yeah, so the clock's ticking the whole time. So the, the second guy I talked to, he gave me everything, and he would have given me more. He would have given me, he was like, I can run run in the back and check on the back of the router for you. And I'm like, no, 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 don't do that. You're good. Let's talk about other stuff. And, uh, I mean, so he really would have given anything, and it was partly the, because this company is... Uh, it is extremely team oriented for one right. and I was I was implying that I was uh, from the headquarters I said I was with a certain team from a certain city right so it implied that I yeah was, exactly I'm with corporate I was with yeah corporate well here's the thing like and yeah. real quick I still have friends on Facebook that say, hey, a guy just called me and said I have Microsoft errors on my computer. Is this a scam? And everybody's like, oh, my God. But it's like the fact that he goes, I talked to him this whole time. Yeah, no, I mean, it still works, obviously. Right, right, because otherwise it wouldn't be called as much. But that's like, you don't want to say that's the type of level at retail, but it it is. Well, yeah, and really, so this guy, he was, uh, the the culture of the company is extremely team-oriented. He's a customer service person. He was doing... He was res- he responded. He was super helpful and forthcoming because that's what he was that's trained to do. Yeah. And they had no if they'd had a process in place that said, "Oh, you say you're calling from another store or the headquarters. Great. What's the last you know four digits of your employee ID? Yeah. So I can check that. I mean, just something like that would have raised the bar, the barrier to entry significantly. And oh, yeah. So it really and, and so I feel like. If, he, if that guy understood, had had some training where he understood that giving that kind of information to someone who's not supposed to have it would harm the company, yeah. I couldn't have gotten anything from him. You're right. I think he would have been a fierce defender because he loved working at the place, which was great. Made it for, for good rapport building on yeah. my part. But <laughs> well, yeah, it makes it a little I easier. I talk yeah. about how, what a great place it is, and, you know, so we kind of, like, bond over our phone call about, you know, the great company swag and all right, that. So, yeah, so, I mean, you said there were 29 pieces of info. So, I mean, was yes. there a subset that you were supposed to gather ahead of time and then get the rest during these calls, or was it... 
you found out all the inf information ahead of time for a new set of data that you had to gather during the calls? No, I, so it was the same set of flags, and they're worth half points during research, and then during the calls, full points. And so I, I talked to two people, and so, uh, for example, operating system, right. what operating system they have, uh, I got that, I had them got confirmations from both, so I got double points on that nice. flag. Nice. Yep. Um, but because I already knew the answers to most of those questions, I was able to fashion a script where I was just confirming. They say, hey, uh, yeah, you're running Windows 8, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, move on. Yeah. Hey, you're running yeah. up? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, and then the only thing that's different between research and uh, competition is asking the person to navigate to a website, and that's worth like 25 points, so that's like the big right. point item is if you can get them to go, and it took four tries because the first, and they, you have to get them to go to the socialengineer.org website. Okay. So it's not a random one. It's right. one, and, and you get them to describe that they see like a blue head or or something about awareness, yep. training, and uh, and then you get the, the points, but their shortened, their normal shortened URL was blocked, and so I had a list of other shorteners for it. First, like the Bitly was blocked. I had, I mean, so I had this guy try like four different things, and he was willingly just typing the stuff in. And but, but yeah, no, but, you're still telling me to a website I can't get to. Let me have another one. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, and that was the only point at which he he finally said, "What? Oh, what's this supposed to be?" And I yeah. said, "Oh yeah, you know, it's a, it's a, a training site." And I had just asked, "Do you block websites? Are you do you block? Is your access to Facebook blocked?" And then I said, I need you to type in a URL because I need to make sure that you can get there. And so that was the... Yeah. Ah. <laughs> See, now yeah. to me, it's fun seeing social engineering. We talk about it all the time, like in things like yeah. this. But I'm seeing it more in pop culture. Like, I'm a huge Ray Donovan fan, right, uh -huh. on Showtime. Uh -huh. And they just had it on the last show Monday. They had a social engineering segment where the one guy paid off the sysadmin so he can get the IP address of the guy he was trying to frame at this oh company, gosh, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he took a picture of his the IP address, right? Now he got into his PC from back home, but he needed to get that. So, I mean, he paid him a couple grand. But it's fun because it's bringing it into, I guess, the more people that don't normally know this happens. Yeah. Just to, just to get visibility. To it. Yeah, yeah, and the thing that was, uh, this was the third time I've done this competition, and what really stood out to me this year as I did my research, 21% of my flag evidence was off of photo sharing sites, like Instagram. Really? For real. Really. I, including, a, like, a wireless SSID. I mean, things that, really, how, how could you find that on Instagram? How is that even on Instagram? But it was, it's all simple, these like simple social moments that people have that they want to share with their friends. Yeah. And they take a picture of their desk, and that's what this was. Somebody, a guy had walked away from his desk, didn't lock his computer, co-worker, uh, le you know, leaves a troll note on the guy's right. on the guy's thing, and he comes back, he thinks it's funny. He takes a picture and shares it up on Instagram, and I, I'm scrolling through, and I Oh, a picture of a computer. I want to see what's on here. Yep. And it was taped right onto the monitor. Like, what? Still. So still. People still do that. Right. Um, badge pictures. I found so many badge pictures. Oh, that pictures. doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of it was people. Hey, new job. Click. Exactly. Yeah. That was exactly it. Well, we we talked excited. about on the, on the podcast on Monday. Um, about that they saw the picture of the TSA key and some guy went oh, yeah. to a 3D printer and made yes. the TSA key Absolutely. and it was downloaded 30,000 times before somebody pulled the plug. Yes. But it's out there now. Right? Yeah, so it's like, out. what are you going to do? It's, yeah. Right. Yeah. But, it's great. <laughs> but, but who tells you not to take a picture of a... I mean, granted, I would never take a picture of a key and I'm not that stupid. <laughs> or like my it's ID. It's kind of odd. Right. choice, right? <laughs> but like, I remember like when my kid got into middle school she got her first ID. I took a picture and put it on Facebook. I said, oh, I've got her first ID. But, like, it's got the barcode scan on it. I mean, maybe I shouldn't have done that. You know, but I'm not thinking. You yeah. know, I'm telling you, oh, my cute kid is in middle school. Right, right. right. And I think for the badge thing, uh, from an end user perspective, you think, well, it's a, what is it? It's my picture. And if you're in the habit of posting your picture on Instagram all the time, clearly, I'm, always, I'm always posting that's that. That's not a big yep. deal. Lots of people, I post my picture five times a day. In your name, you think, and, and it's easy to think that somebody says, well, you know, yeah, everyone who knows me knows my name. What's yeah. the big deal? And so I think we need to shift how we do awareness 
to really describe, like, okay, you guys, this special circumstance of your name and your picture, that can, that can harm the company. Mm-hmm. And, and, is and it, it, now, is it's it, not for you guys, like, you have an easy name, David Dave Phillips, right? It's a common name. Mine is Bob Waltenspiel, right? Yeah. It's me. <laughs> there isn't another one. So, I mean, yeah. is it harder for guys like me, or for, like, if you have a common name than, than it is for a guy like me, or is it, is it really irrelevant? Uh, I don't know. I mean... Do you follow what I'm saying, though, right? Is it... Are you, are you asking if you're... you're no, because, because no, my right. Twitter's out there. I'm easy to find. I'm well, it is, but that is, but that doesn't matter to the security guard that's sitting there where somebody found your Cisco ID online and they pasted their picture over yours because security guy doesn't know who Bob Waldenspiel no, is. No. He just knows that that's a valid badge with the right barcode right. and that picture matches that guy. Yeah. Okay, true. Yeah. yeah. It could yep. be Darth Vader for like, yeah, no, yeah, good point, good point. No, I'm just, no, because I, I don't think about these things, and I really should because I'm in the, you know, it's my business. But I look at like going into my office, like people trailing all the time. We have a, a lobby ambassador, right? Is what we call him. Yeah, that's uh, a nice title. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but like, we have people and pro- uh, partners and customers coming in all day long, and you could sit there all day and not one person would question who you're from. Yeah, and and, and we're the we're the leader of. I, the, the IT business, yeah. and th- th- that's what happens every day. Granted, I don't know yes. what they could take, but you could sit in that office all day. Yeah, mm-hmm. so. yeah no, no, it's surprising the kinds of things that you can get access to, the kind of information that's just available online about a lot of companies. Corporate case studies, like a vendor case study, oh, yeah. that they, they love to do, right? We'll give you an extra... X off of, you know, right. if we can, you know, write up the project. Well, we find there's all kinds of information contained in those. Well, and that's the part that's, that kills me. I mean, and that's been yeah. one of our frequent topics of conversation is, you know, like the Ashley Madison hack or the yes. Target hack or, yes. you know, the, it's not those individual data sets. I mean, yes, those individual data sets being out there are bad. Mm-hmm. But what people aren't looking down the road towards is, okay, it's the combination of those data sets. Yes. Where, okay, I have this username on Ashley Madison matched with this username from Target.com matched with this username from Chase. Yeah. Odds are good that, you know, and then, oh, look, it's the same email address. Yeah, that's the same person. Hey, let me go try to hammer on the Bank of America website and see if that same user ID and password works. Yeah. You know, because that was the, the latest thing was, you know, the hash that they used to protect passwords yeah. was nothing in that Ashley Madison oh, file that's out oh, there now. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just actually saw a post on, on Twitter that was saying, you know, don't tell me what the top 10 most common passwords in that last breach were because they're all they're going to be all the same stupid ones. Right. How many were cracked within 24 hours? Yeah. Like, tell, tell, me, tell me that. Apparently all of them. It's, yeah, because it's trivial. But yeah, apparently the hash yeah. was really, really weak. Yeah, nice. So... <laughs> So now, so you've won. Yes. Like, do you get to come back as reigning champion and talk smack to people? Yeah, Is it pick oh, the I belt, like wrestling? I get to, like, I, oh, oh, you didn't see the badge. No, I did not. It's very Illuminati. I like it. Yeah, yeah. It has radioactive materials in it, too. Oh, boy. Yeah, just, <laughs> yeah, never walking through a, a... Yeah, how'd you get it back home? It, it went right through TSA, no problem. Oh, uh, you yeah. like plutonium yeah, on Amazon. Course. It's yeah. no big deal. Yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, not a problem. But, um, so I can't compete again. Again, because there's a one and done rule okay. for, for winners, but I certainly could go back and talk smack. Yeah, nice. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. So now, I guess here's the question: Like, so how does that, like, does that relate to what you do day to day with your job? Yes. And and like, so like, you know, get a good pat on the back and a nice way to go when you got back home? Or? <laughs> yeah, <definitely. laughs> great, now go make me some money. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah great, now we're going to have to pay you more. That's, yeah, that's right. yeah. So social engineering pen testing is part of what, what I do. Okay. And uh, as well as uh, risk assessments, compliance assessments, uh, awareness training, and uh, all, of, all of that. So, awesome. Yeah. All right, well, thanks for stopping yes. by, Jen. It was good to see you again. We haven't seen you in a while. I know. I, I know. I've got to stop by sometime yeah. soon. We got, yeah. we got one of the big ones. Nice got one of the big ones going on tomorrow night. Tomorrow? Yeah, down at the Majestic. We'll be oh. there. Oh, my gosh. After doing this, you're going to go there? Yeah, tomorrow night. Yeah. Yeah, wow. It's a- so, okay. Yeah, so, you know, yeah. since we are talking about, you know, since we are talking about the day job, uh, what do you do for your day job? And, like, so how does that apply, you know, from the DEF CON thing? Oh, right. Um, I'm a senior security consultant with Viopoint in Auburn Hills. And I, so I do do social engineering pen testing as part of my work in addition to uh, compliance assessments, risk assessments, security awareness training, and policy work. 
Okay. She so, said doo doo, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, one would assume, uh, so how do people find Viopoint and what do they find out more about what you do if they're looking for that kind of information and help? Viopoint.com is our website. Okay. We also have a blog where we post weekly. On a weekly basis, we have blog posts on a variety of topics uh, covering all the different things that we do. Awesome. Oh, yeah. All right, well, hey, Jen, thanks for coming out and sitting by. Thanks we're sitting a lot. in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Dave. So, hey, we're doing a live broadcast here at Secure World uh, Live in Detroit. Uh, this is the IT and the D Show, and uh, we will be right back. This is a previously recorded episode of the IT and the D Show. IT in the D, networking Detroit, one beer at a time. IT in the D.com. I'll take pictures. Oh, anyway. All right, and welcome back. This is the IT and the D Show special edition from the floor of Secure World Detroit. We're hanging out here in uh, the Ford Auditorium in beautiful Dearborn, Michigan. This is Bob the Sales Guy, always here with Dave the Geek. And we have a special guest. We're joined by uh, Chris Shane, uh, who's the Senior Director of Systems Engineering at Surdy's Networks. Um, we got to introduce you through a mutual friend, Tali Marcus, from, uh, from Zing Wireless. But, uh, and he kind of gave me an overview, but what, what in the world is Surdy's Wireless and why are you guys here? Surdy's Networks. So we... Uh, sorry, sorry. I was thinking yes. of Tali. Basically, uh, our, our role is uh, making data in motion simple. Uh, we've been uh, in business for about 15 years. Grew out of Lucent. Uh, we protect about okay. 2.5 terabits of data per second in over 84 countries. Uh, so since we do have, we do get a wide variety of listeners from the technical to the not so technical. So when you say data in motion, mm-hmm. what so, does that mean? So basically, anytime anyone's accessing information, be it email, moving between networks, uh, any any information moving beyond your LAN over some untrusted network gotcha. to another location, uh, any user accessing an application, be it in the cloud, be it provided by you, software as a service doesn't matter. Okay. So anytime the, the traffic is moving across the network, that's what we mean in terms of data in motion. Okay. So, I, you know, you, you think about typical point-to-point protocols, you know, SSL, VPN, that kind of stuff. So what is it that Surtees does, you know, to help manage that so, sort of thing? So your traditional uh, security approaches are very uh, uh, infrastructure-based. Right. right. So you're, you're basically provisioning an IPsec tunnel between routers uh, or your your enabling it through the firewall or you're setting it up via the switch, you know, 22 steps or what have you yep. that are very difficult to manage. They're prone to gaps. Um, it basically uh, present a lot of uh, challenges in terms of performance, typically, um, in terms of degrading the performance. Tends to get sluggish, yeah. So, uh, so, so the notion is to basically pull that out of the network layer. Uh, we have a combination of, of solutions, essentially, with, with two main core components. Uh, a management console that, that provides a single point of control, where you identify policies, either network-based policies that say, for example, I'm going to protect this location and these subnets to this location and these subnets, or the, this port, or this okay. you know, IP address to this IP address, or this user to this particular application. Regardless of where the user is, regardless of what the network is, regardless of what the topology is, we're extrapolating out of that. And basically, think of it this way, of putting a secure overlay in place that's an application segment to which I will grant access based on your role right. through what we call a crypto flow. I was going to say, I mean, there's got to be some sort of credentialing mechanism. There's got to be right. some sort of auth. There's, yeah. That's right. And so essentially in the apt case, what's happening is a one-time enrollment process. We're using OpenVPN as the basis from the device to the proxy point. Okay? The application segment is built between the proxy point and the gateway. The okay. proxy point would be closest to the application or to the user. Yep. Gateway closest to the application as possible. And we... These enforcement points can be uh, run on, a, say, a Dell 220 blade, or they can be uh, virtual. Okay. So a virtual crypto flow application enforcement point. Okay. Um, so between those, we're essentially establishing a segmented network by application. Right. So uh, from the device to the proxy point, we're talking uh, an open VPN tunnel, and then assuming you're authenticated. Now, how does that happen? one-time enrollment 
where you basically sign up. Uh, we're, we're integrated with Active Directory. Okay. And essentially learning your groups. Then you create what's called crypto flows, which essentially take those groups, let's say doctors, and identify the applications that they're allowed to access through a given security profile, okay. which identifies the algorithm, the, the encryption algorithm to use, as well as how often to refresh keys. Okay, so essentially now a user attempts to en enroll. I'm going to install certificates, assuming they're authenticated, on that device. Right. Now the user attempts to access an application just as they normally would. You don't start a VPN. You don't, you don't do any of that. You just access the application. It goes off to the enforcement point and authenticates you, fires the VPN automatically, and then determines if you are actually authorized for that particular application. Okay. If you are not, it drops your traffic. Or it can redirect you to a page to say, call this Right. So, I mean, so you've, you've got your auth, you've got obviously, you know, cert expiration and all that kind of fun stuff. So, mm -hmm. I mean, like how, you know, you mentioned medical, you know, right. obviously with HIPAA and all that yeah. other fun stuff going on. I mean, that's, Financial, that, yeah. So I was going to say, like, who are you, who are you seeing the most interest from? I mean, like, you know, who should be looking at this primarily? The, the, so traditionally, uh, you know, a lot of the interest has come from the companies that, that are heavily compliance ridden. You know, right. That could be NERC, that could be power and that kind of stuff. Uh, but largely, it's been financial driven, healthcare driven because of HIPAA, uh, government driven, and so on. And those are our primary verticals in the past. But with, with the new solution, it's really anywhere you think about the target scenario. And I know they get picked on. But people don't steal your device to try to monetize what's on it from you. Right. They basically are stealing your certs so that they can get to the network because a traditional VPN provides access to the network. Yep. Okay. Now I'm going to go and, and port scan, and I'm going to VLAN hop, and I'm going to find all your holes and figure out where I can... Well, yeah, because it's not, it's not what can I get from you. It's what can I get by being you. Exactly right. And so by being you, I get access to 40,000 records, not one record. Right. Uh, so basically what our solution is doing is implementing that cryptographic segmentation through the LAN that everyone's talking about that basically blocks that number one attack vector. If you're not a member of the crypto flow, you're basically denied access. You're not granted access to the network. You're granted access to the application. And it's a, we're, we're basically in, ensure, or encrypting or securing right. that connection from the device all the way to the application itself. So, and I mean, with all the fun and excitement going on, I mean, it's still news to a lot of places. But, I mean, BYOD is not going away. Correct. Um, you know, and so this seems like a good... No, I, I guess here's the thing. So, like, when you say, you know, I want to access an app. So, I mean, is that an app that the company already has and they put your wrapper around it? Or is this something that you develop for companies? Okay. Uh, so, so our application is a one-time enroll. All it's doing is making it easy to, you're to doing enable the You're doing the middle. Yeah, gotcha. After that... The application doesn't matter. You identify an application through an IP address in a port, through a domain name. That has to adhere a, to those specific. Yeah. Gotcha. So it can be an application that you're serving. It can be an application that you're using through AWS. We don't care about Makes the perfect underlying sense. network. Essentially, we're going we're gonna to kind of take care of getting the packet where it needs to go, but do so in, in a secure manner as opposed to... So it, it's it's one. Yeah, you're you're building the alarm. You're not building the car. We're we're actually. So I would, from from an alarm perspective, we're not allowing more of a theft deterrent. Yeah. The right? <laughs> so so it's you know we're building the pit bull in the passenger yeah. seat. <laughs> there, there you go. That's right. That's right. It's a guy chasing you out of the car. Right. 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 <laughs> Very cool. So, I, uh, what brought you here to Secure World? I mean, like, so, like, what? Uh, we have been actually supporting Secure World. What we found was that for our industry, we we it's so much easier to come to a conference that is focused on security. You're talking to folks who understand what you're talking about. You don't have to explain. Everyone but me. Just let's put, make that clear. <laughs> let's make that clear. It's all good, Bob. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll go slow. That's why I'm a sales guy. <laughs> sorry, small words, two syllables. That's why I'm <laughs> channeling my Chris Farley going, I'm sorry, I don't speak Japanese like, during this whole thing. It's all right, though. I'm break out some Chris Farley. That'll be good. Yeah. In fact, one of the things I use in my demo is the scene from Tommy Boy. 
uh, which is a clear physical security need. As, as we know, yeah. two, two bozos break on a plane, that's kind of an issue. Yeah. But uh, anyway, what it, what it does is show that our solution uh, really kind of, there's, there's a number of things that it solves. It's a one-and-done centrally managed solution. It's hitless, most important, meaning that it's, we're, we're talking sub-millisecond latency, uh, means that we can support latency-sensitive applications like voice over IP right. or multicast video. Uh, and that's, that's what I show with that. I'm actually broadcasting Tommy Boy to two other PCs and implementing security in between and showing, look, there's no hit to the traffic whatsoever. Well, and, and that was going to be my next question, since you, know, you, you brought up latency earlier, uh, talking about SSL and VPN mm -hmm. tunnels and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So negligible degradation then? Yeah, negligible in terms of in the low microseconds. Uh, you start to see degradation with voice over IP somewhere around 30 milliseconds. We're below one millisecond, far below one millisecond. Nice. Um, and then the, the other piece is, is basically the seamless way that we, we can go into a network. You basically can go and deploy our solutions in minutes. Um, it's, it's because it's decoupled from the network layer and because it's completely transparent. Uh, essentially, there's you don't have to change a firewall, a switch. You don't have to do anything with your netting. You don't have to change your network in any way whatsoever. That makes admins happy. It does. <laughs> it absolutely does. Well, that's what I was going to say. It makes resellers happy, too, to be honest with you, because, yeah. because the bottom line is it's you, you can add it very easily without changing the duration of a project. Sure. I mean, that's the thing when I was introduced to you guys from, from Tali, and, and he's probably one of the few people in this industry I would call a packet geek. And, and if he trusts you, then, then I'm good. That's kind of my role in this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Good to hear. Um, so other than that, I mean, what, did you guys learn anything when you were here? Are you guys trying to just spread the word? or what, what's, most, I mean, Mostly uh, spreading the word. We're, we're mostly marketing. And we're supporting all of the secure worlds. Like I say, this has been, uh, it, it's been a really good fit for us because when we go and talk about our solutions, we're talking to people who are trying to solve these problems. As opposed to the and and we get that I mean like it, you know if you don't know the background of us uh, you know we basically started a networking group for IT folks in the Metro oh, Detroit industry back in 2001 because we hated every other networking group out there on the planet <laughs> and I was the only sales guy that was allowed to show up yeah exactly you know. so I mean it but it is I mean it's you know you want when you go to an event you want a room full of IT people because right. they speak the same language right. they right. get it they it, it was always you know he wanted you know to you know complain about sales I wanted to you know rail about WebSphere or whatever was making me mad that week. And if somebody's trying to sell you a fruit basket, they don't really get it, right. and it's a pointless conversation. They're, they were more focused on, I mean, we were going to places that were more focused on voice over IP type solutions and, 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 never, and knew what a, never knew what a security tunnel, what a VPN was, or how it was implemented, or right. why I was doing it. So, um, well, yeah, because you don't really necessarily want to go to a voice over IP conference. You want the voice over IPs company's security guy who's here to come back, to go back, that yeah, makes right. perfect sense. Precisely. Right. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks for joining us. Where do people find out more? Uh, they can go to certusnetworks.com. We have a uh, tremendous C -E -R -T -E -S. amount of C-E-R-T-E-S. C-E-R-T-E-S. It's, it's, it's the anagram for secret. You know, we talked about that. So it's <laughs> C-E-R-T-E-S. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, essentially, a tremendous amount of information there. Uh, we've got a number of videos available out on the site that kind of talk a little bit more about the solutions and and use cases, and we have we and, got gifts uh, and gifts, and we're handing out gifts. Well, How about blue that? mics? I want one. <laughs> now I have one. This is great. Nice. Yes, this so, is sweet. Uh, just spreading the word. I mean, the, the the primary word is there's a much easier way to do this stuff to stop the madness. I mean, uh, unfortunately, a lot of times what we see is that the security group is is tasked with certain requirements that they keep running into a roadblock when they hit the IT folks because you know uh, there's been such a good job of educating folks on the traditional way to do things in right. the infrastructure everybody goes through and they get their Cisco certification nothing against that yeah. it's all great and it's it's important learning but what i learn is an IPsec tunnel is the way to go we're just trying to get the word out that there's a much easier way to do this that's nose to tail that doesn't degrade your network, that's managed from a single location, that supports cloud infrastructure, et cetera. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, but it's no different than, you know, the, the kids, and I hate making myself feel like a grandfather when I say this, but, you know, the kids that come out of school and they don't understand why nobody's giving them a $100,000 a year job. Right. And it's like, dude, 
great. You learned how the book that was probably written 10 years ago told you how to do it. Right. You have no real world practical. I, I assure you, it, it didn't work that way in the real world when that book got published. Correct. It sure as hell doesn't work that way in the real world now. You got it. <laughs> Absolutely dead on. You know, you, you, you got to get down in the trenches and understand the actual business problems these guys are yeah. trying to solve. And, you know, I think there's a disparity of, of uh, you know, sometimes the CISOs know you know, the policies they're looking to implement, but don't understand the techno- technological, you know, implications of the, of yeah, the traditional I think I, mechanism. I pretty much found that, yeah, Cisco guys are really good at ideas, but not necessarily execution. Stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to kick Chris off when he was talking about, oh, Cisco suit's not a big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. It is a big deal. I'm just being Actually, funny. it is a big deal. No, I work for Cisco. I'm just being funny. It is a big deal. Yeah. That's awesome. You you cannot get information. We going back to data in motion. You cannot get information from point A to point B without the likes of a system. Mm-hmm. Yeah, indeed. All, all, all we're saying is, let a router route, let a switch switch, let a firewall keep the bad guys out. There's there's goodness to singularity of a purpose, and let somebody. You know, let's put it this way: security is too important to be a hobby. Well, and, and well, that's we talk, true. We I mean, talk about layering all the time too, and yeah. it's just a, it's you know it's buying the gun front of the coffee table. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's another level of protection for whatever it is that you're protecting. That's right. Pit bull in the passenger seat, right? I hate to use that one again. Oh no, but, but it's it, it makes sense, right? It's right. like I want to keep people out of my car. Yeah. You know what what what, it, to what I'm not just going to lock it. I need to do something else. Yeah. You can well, buy a club. Is, are they oh, yeah, are they, is that still a thing? <laughs> yeah, who knows? <laughs> but no, I mean we you know we've talked about that where you know it's not you know one of the issues. I mean, well, the biggest issue the internet faces, and this is why we keep seeing breaches every other day, is because it was designed to be open and trusting. It was designed by academics right. who wanted to share papers. Right. It wasn't necessarily designed to be completely locked down and secure. Right. And so you have, you know, you do. You have, you know, companies that go, okay, yeah, we have a router, that also. We have a switch, that also. You know, because it is that, okay, yeah, there's a problem to be solved, yeah, you know, I'm sure at some point you know, we've all owned the TV, DVD, yes, yes. possibly and VHS player all combo unit. Mm-hmm. They suck. We all know they suck. They go out pretty quick, <laughs> yeah. and, you know. And then one part of it dies, which makes the entire thing a j- paperweight. And, yeah. Right. Right. No, it's actually it's a good approach. I'm I, I'm intrigued. I'm actually I'm going to go take a look. That's good to hear. So again, it's it's Certus Networks, C E R T E S Networks dot com. Correct. Um, a whole bunch of videos. I'm assuming probably white papers and all, all that kinds fun of stuff. White papers. Use Every cases, security company. Articles <laughs> awesome. and uh, you know more product information, etc. Et awesome. Very very cool. Thank you for stopping by and sitting down with us. I really My appreciate pleasure. it. Chris, appreciate nice the time. You. This is a previously recorded episode of the I T and the D Show. IT in the D, networking Detroit, one beer at a time, itinthed.com. They want one particular thing and one particular job, and that's all they want. Oh. It's the cousin, we call him cousin, we call him cousin Eddie's. Yeah. Eddie hasn't found a job in seven years, so he's been holding out for a management position. You know, it's, you know. No, I, I totally agree, because, uh. It's just nuts, all the free resources that are out there. Entitlement classes is, is hurting yeah, a lot of people. A lot of, you know, the open course were from MIT. Oh, my God, yeah. Um, there's stuff from Stanford. Well, and that's the thing we always we talk the, about. The, the Salesforce.com. Okay. All the okay. Salesforce.com. Everything's free. Well, that, go to Salesforce. Yeah. Download the ID, you know, the development environment. Yep. Learn their uh-huh. language. Start developing apps for their for their platform. Like, if you have a career gap, you should be doing that. You should be blogging. You should be volunteering. Yep. Like, eight hours a day. That's your yep. job. Like, if you're not doing that, you know. There's how many open source? What's your, what do I call you, John Turner from Ford? What uh, do I call sure. you though? Yeah. What do I call you from Ford? Uh, security engineer. Security. Perfect. Me, um, I'm just a reporter, Andrew Humphrey, WDIB. Got it. Report. Got it. Okay. Go. Hey, and welcome back. This is the uh, special edition of the IT Video Show. We're broadcasting live from the floor here at Secure World Detroit. This is uh, Bob, the sales guy, always here with Dave the Geek. Find us online, itnity.com, and we've been having fun today. We are joined, special guest, Andrew Humphrey, who is the meteorologist from WDIV. Hello, Bob. Hello, Dave. Hello, everyone. We keep running into a weather guy at our event. <laughs> <I know. laughs> what are you doing? Follow the good weather. And we, uh, we picked up another straggler. we got John Turner here, who is a uh, security 
um, architect, engineer. Eng engineer with uh, Ford Motor. Hello. Well, we appreciate you guys sitting down with me. And, and you know, Andrew, I got to ask you, we've been seeing you at our events now for the past, what, three, four months. That's right. You can't get rid of me. What's the weatherman doing at IT <laughs> events these days? Well, you know, I'm a geek just like you guys. Okay. Uh, in addition to being a weather nerd and a geek, being a techie like this, I'm just simply interested in all things with science and technology. Um, I got a BSc in meteorology from the University of Michigan, uh, my master's in meteorology from MIT. Um, so this stuff basically runs through my veins. Yeah, so uh, you know, that's a great job because you could have went IT where if you're wrong, you get in trouble, but now being the weatherman, you're wrong, you get praised. So it's, you know. <laughs> that was the computer model. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The model was wrong. It was like, uh, <laughs> the radar. Right, right. Let's another TV station. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but what's up? So what's the best thing you've seen out here today? Are, are you, like, see, here me, I'm a sales guy. Yeah. There's stuff I get, there's stuff I don't, and I'm okay with that as a human being. <laughs> I mean, is there stuff that's intrigued you? Is there stuff that's, uh, you know, yeah. anything? All this stuff is intriguing. I mean, with Secure World, from a from a storytelling perspective, it's really a great opportunity for me to network with, with some folks here in Detroit and Southeast Michigan who are from the security world. Um, so I get a good base of, okay, who are the main players in this world, whether they're in Detroit, Southeast Michigan or not, for present or future story ideas. Perfect, perfect. And then, John, you know, Andrew brought you over. He said you had some uh, some cool stories. So what, what how's things in life at Ford, and what, uh, what are you doing these days? Oh, they're great. I work on connected vehicle security, um, specifically vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications. So it's kind of the wild, wild west. We've had that topic once or twice. Once or yeah. twice, yeah. yeah. It's a hot topic with us. It's, uh, you know, 1994, Internet 1994 again. Right, right. Um, basically wide open. It it's, gets a lot of people um, thinking, get a lot of good questions when you talk about it and bring it up. So how fun was your week when the uh, when they hacked that Jeep or what it? Uh, well, I know it, it was, wasn't Ford. It wasn't yeah, I know Ford. it wasn't Ford. <laughs> but I mean, it did, it was that a we big? Were, uh, we were all secretly cheering, though. No, I, I, <laughs> I mean, was that a big uh oh moment by you that you know, we got to look at things? Or uh, well, actually, that that it did drive that at Ford as we very quickly looked at it and said, are we at you know at risk for the same type of uh, issue? And we had a couple third parties come in and we found out that we're not. Um, so yeah, it definitely it's not uh, it's something that's pretty serious, and we all take it seriously when it does happen to, to uh, our competitors. For sure. That is some wake up call. Oh, absolutely. Well, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, that's that's almost the sort of the good touch of and bad touch of being in security. You know, it, it's almost like the CIA. You you never hear about them when things go right. Right. It, it's only when something winds up on the front page because something has gone horribly wrong, and then it's oh well. That's our security guy. <laughs> I always want to know, like, you know, who's the guy that signed off on that? You know, yeah. Somebody somewhere well, signed off on, well, you know, should, hey, this is, this is okay. Well, yeah, exactly. We, we had that conversation on our show God, about, about a, oh, a couple weeks ago, a month ago, whenever it happened. We were like, you know that somewhere in that building there is just a security hardcore guy that's going... Um, I, I tried breaking into 14 different meetings and I sent you 87 different emails telling you that this would happen and no one listened to me and you all ignored me because you had to have the product out. Da, da, da. I mean, that's like a natural way to channel your inner Milton. Someone took my stapler. Welcome to my world when it snows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a surprise to whoever. It's all your fault. You made it snow, Andrew. <laughs> uh, I told you about it. There you go. <laughs> right. But also, I mean, that's 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 that, that is one of the challenges when it comes to you know security. I mean, you've got, you know, we we've talked about it a couple times today. You know, everybody that wants bring your own device, and everybody that wants the connected car, and I want my apps in my car, you know, but don't you dare track me, and I want this, and but you better don't you give dare. me my Pandora, and you better give me my Google Maps, but you better not hack my car. You know, you can't have it both ways. It just doesn't yeah. work like that. Yeah, that's what uh, people fail to see it. They think that uh, they, you know. I made a joke in my presentation, flying cars for everybody, but <laughs> at what's the cost? And, and everybody wants the, they want the cake, but they don't want to have to make, uh, bake it. Yeah. Well, I mean, and that's the chaos with this stuff. You know, we've talked about, you know, connected cars and all that stuff where it's, you know, you're going to have that in-between world where, I mean, you know what? If everybody has a connected car, I think we're okay. As long as you still have that human element of, us being the idiot species that we are behind the wheels of cars, you're gonna have wacky mayhem. Sure. You know, and that's you know, and, and I guess you know, here's a good question. This is the, the one we always talk about is you know, so okay, who's gonna get sued? 
You know, so like, you know, there, somebody somewhere has to write that line of code that said if you're driving down the road at 70 miles an hour and a tree falls across or the truck jackknives and you've got the boxy but good Volvo next to you and then you've got the Mini Cooper on the other side, which one do you hit? Or worse, the guy riding the bicycle next to you. Right. Okay, and now factor in that the guy that's riding the bicycle is a Nobel Prize winner. Yeah. And you're a mechanic. <laughs> yeah. Now, you know. I mean, it, it's a silly, it's a silly proposition to even think of it well, that way. A life is there's life. There's trillions. Still, there's trillions of, of those things that happen. Permutations, sure. Yeah, yeah. You, there's no way you can define. Well, there, was, there was that story that just came out last week about the Google car and the uh, hipster on his fixie with yep. the, the one speed bike, yep. and you know, so as as he was as the as the bicyclist was sitting there trying to keep himself upright and active, rocking back and forth, he was screwing with the Google car hard, right? Because you know, Google car detects bicyclists in motion. Yep. Stop. Okay, well, now he's kind of stopped. Pull forward six inches. Oh, no, moving again. Stop. Pull forward six inches. Uh, and, and, you know, they had the video where it was like a half an hour of that going on. <laughs> yes. Was that guy toying with her? Was he just... No, he didn't, he didn't even know. He didn't know. Oh, that was stupid. <laughs> yeah, they interviewed him after. Yeah, the guy on the bicycle had no idea what the hell was going on. And they, yeah. Oh, that's wild. You know, for me as a storyteller, I have tech time with Andrew Humphrey uh, also. And you mentioned, you're right. Uh, it's great to think of all these systems and the ideal, how much good they, they can have for individuals and for society as a, whole, as a whole. But you have just that one screw up or that one bad actor, and that's simply what makes headlines. And it can screw the whole thing up. Well, and that sort of security job is to be that, to kind of be the goalie, you know, if you will, where, you know what, yeah, dude, I get it. You want all this cool, open, free flowing data. But, <laughs> right, <laughs> you know, and it's and it's always that possibility versus probability. You know, is it possible this can happen? Sure. Right. Is it probable that it's going to happen? Meh. Yeah, and you hate to be the boogeyman or the guy who's always screaming. You know, the, the sky is falling. The sky is falling. But you know, there are real concerns out there, especially with uh, connect the car about safety and, and privacy and security and uh, malicious bad actors. Um, you know, and they're really, you have to take those into consideration and consider them and whether or not it's valuable for everybody. You know, Bob and Dave, one of the things during John's presentation that was absolutely amazing, and John, you can uh, obviously go into more detail about it, was talking about the huge volumes of data that he's talking about oh, when it God, comes yeah. to these new systems that are coming out. Oh, storage guys are phenomenal. salivating. Yes. Storage guys are loving life. Yes, With individual are. cars transmitting their information 10 times a second. Yeah. If you're if you're selling NetApp filers or uh, <laughs> right. AMC storage or Teradata, you're like yes, connect bring it, our, bring <laughs> IoT. <laughs> we want that connected. Why IoT up. is awesome. <laughs> <That> is. <laughs> Collect everything. <laughs> what went through my mind was the big uh, data camp that the U.S. government is building out in Utah. Is yep. that is that associated with? Uh, this not, type of work no, or not? not to my not on the current project that I'm okay. working on, but. That's for your phone calls and all that stuff, <laughs> <laughs> or, or things we can't talk about on you know on the show. So I mean, so what else is on the connected car world? I mean, we talk about the stuff you're reading in the paper. What's what's some of the stuff you you're not seeing in the paper or stuff that you're working on? Um, the thing that I'm working on uh, most of my time is it's the credential management system, and it's the thing that's going to allow every, cars to trust the messages that the other cars send. Uh, basically, a certificate system, a PKI. It'll be the largest PKI ever built by orders of magnitude. I would imagine. At full de production deployment, we're talking about 500 billion certificates, give or take, Dude. that are going to have to be managed at any given time um, by the uh, SCMS. So it's it's really interesting. There's a lot of questions that are still unanswered. There's a lot of use cases that we're still trying to figure out. It's not a done deal by any means. Um, but it's pretty fascinating. There's a lot of really smart people working on it. Um, partnership with Ford and GM and a lot of uh, the other OEMs like Honda and Nissan, um, also with U of M, the Transportation Research Institute, UMTree. Um, so they're involved too. So it's, it's, it's really fascinating. And the thing is that um, it's really just a stepping stone. And I think the number that I hear a lot is that um, in 10 years, there's going to be a 50-50 chance that your car will run into another car that can talk to it. Yeah. See, that's why I'm keeping my, I got an old 76 Cadillac. That's why I'm like, I'm going to keep that forever. No electronics. No, it's got an 8-track in it. Um, I don't know if you know, uh, Elena Farnsworth runs Mobile Compliance. She's big into the connected vehicle thing. And she wanted to wire my car with modern diagnostic 
you know, like connect okay. the stuff for the Woodward Dream Cruise. And at first, I was like, great. And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I like having That's a, a slippery slope. Yeah, I like having know, old carburetor, eight track player with Johnny Cash in the deck. That's you know, let's leave it like that. So an off the grid car. It, precisely. I mean, that's the thing. That's been the topic of conversation here. Is it's, it's going to get? It's so gr- technology is so great, but they're like, I just want to unplug. Like, there's it's too much. Like, if you look at what's going on in your house, like, go to Best Buy now. It's not a media company. It's automated. Ho- it's an automated oh, home. It's, it's, our home. Yeah. Oh, it, it's crazy the stuff that's out now. And it's like, you know, I can turn my light bulbs on now with my app, and everything's driven by your damn phone. Open up my door now with my app. My garage door with an app. Um, doorbell, you know what I mean? Everything's driven by your phone. It's all tethered. I mean, it's going to get to the point where your phone's going to tether your car keys. I mean, is it getting there? I mean, in terms of the car? I think eventually, I, I think you see a lot of it coming from the automakers. You've got um, the technology companies like Apple and Google, obviously, are, are, are working hard. Um, Google has said that they're not going to be an automaker. They're not going to produce vehicles. What they want to do is they want to partnership um, with OEMs and, and put their technology into the cars. Um, I think that, you know, there's real concerns there for privacy because, you know, obviously Google... Yeah, they, to have they, data. They were, exactly. They're going to be collecting <laughs> something. And I had somebody ask me that. Uh, they were saying, well, why don't we just do what Google does? You know, why do we have to have the cars talking to each other? Why can't it just be self-contained in every car, every man for himself? And I was like, but the Google car isn't self-contained. It's sending all its data back to Google. Yeah. You know, you, you can drive the Google car all you want, but Google knows everything you're doing. Yeah. There's a little bit different if we're collaborating together at, at the peer-to-peer level. And we're not talking to Big Brother somewhere and saying, "Hey, I went here, or I, t- I saw Bob's car, or whatever." Yeah, you know. I'm surprised you haven't used your favorite line yet, Dave. Dave will never drive an Audi. Um, why, Dave? Oh, I've always said because <laughs> their commercials where they say, "You know, our cars make 2,000 decisions every second. Okay, I know developers. And right. I know QA people, yeah. and so I will never buy an Audi. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's why the smart car slash connected car scares the ever living hell out of me. I, I remember I remember in Y two K, people were like, "Oh, come on, it's not going to be that bad." It's like, no, you don't understand. I am a programmer. Yeah, I've seen one character break systems. Oh, and that, that we're was talking about two. Oh, that was that, double the. It's, it's and double that was the, the best danger. part because you know that came and went. It was yeah. like, oh, see, we told you nothing was happening. I'm like, no, 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 nothing happened because we busted our asses to keep anything from right. happening. Well, well, yeah, <laughs> that's what Dave did. Well, I mean, who were you with at the time? Was it GM or Kmart? Y2K.gm.com. Okay, that was what I built. Yeah, <laughs> that was that was fun. Yeah, that was a that was a good time. There's some fun <laughs> stories there. Uh, all right, so uh, what haven't we hit on that we should before we cut you loose here? Um, I think uh, the one point uh, I'd like to make is that when you talk about connected vehicle, everybody immediately immediately jumps to autonomous vehicle and self-driving car. See, I go to maximum overdrive, Emilio Estevez. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but the, the self-driving car, the idea that um, your car is going to get a message or a transmission from somebody and then do something without your involvement, <laughs> that's, that's not what we're talking about. That's way, 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 way far right. away. We're really all we're talking about is enhancing driver information. So the driver is still going to be in control. They're going to get a message or some sort of indicator that says, "Hey, here's a situation that requires your attention. Do something." You know, up to you. But it's still the driver in control, and I think that's really the point. Is it's a little reassuring. Everybody hears connected vehicle, and they think, and they jump right to self-driving car. And that's not what's happening. You know what I'm tired of? The stupid technology they keep putting in to make us stop being distracted. Um, my wife had a loaner vehicle. Where her car was in the shop. And unless you put your seatbelt on, the stereo is on mute. I'm like, you can kiss my ass. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's the dumbest thing I ever of, So I got to buckle up from Ricardo so I can hear the stupid radio. <laughs> like, that's a, you know, again, it goes back to, and we drove in at Tesla, where we had pretty much two iPads as your dashboard. Everything's digital. Yeah. They're, they're, you know, oh, yeah, this screen sideways was the center console. Yeah. And, I mean, the stuff that, you know, again, it's all automated. It knows, you know. Everything you're doing, and it's like, is that a good thing? I, I think it's a good thing, but there's a part of me that says, no, I want to listen to the radio if I don't have my seatbelt on, you clowns. <laughs> so, I mean, but no, it's, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see where the, the, the world goes. The big, push is, of- the big push is safety. So, uh, as far as the government regulation is concerned, that's their focus point. They're saying they're not coming at it from a, a privacy perspective or whatever. Um, they want to guarantee privacy or to not guarantee, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, it reassure, reassure people. But their push is safety. They're saying by doing this, 
by having cars talk to each other and collaborate with each other, we can save lives. Yeah. We can cut down on crashes. We can cut down on people getting hurt. Um, we can improve mobility, cut down on emissions. You know, Wait, like still, so it's I never saw that other car coming. I never saw well, them exactly. in my blind spot. I never, yeah. If you look at, um, so we, there was a thing that came out, top 10 dangerous jobs in the U.S. I'm a traveling sales guy, right? I cover 13 states. My job came in at number four. <laughs> Firefighters were like six. Yeah. So I, I, I sent it to my firefighter buddies and we laughed, but I go, yeah, it's because of the car accidents, right. man. I go, huh. yep. we're all on the road. We're on our phones. We're, we're on WebEx in the cars. Yep. It, we're, we're not pretty on the road. And it, it'd be, you know, again, if there's anything to add to my safety, I welcome it and with open arms, I'm just leaving it. Yeah, at you're that. waiting for the go home car, <laughs> I'm drunk. Exactly. Car. <laughs> yes, yes. No I saw car, Uber, my car bring me home. <laughs> I saw a Mythbusters uh, episode and they they busted the idea that hands-free made a difference. Yeah. And they, they went and showed that hands-free doesn't make a difference. You're still distracted, and they you still have it's, – it's the same as you. Well, yeah, because you're still thinking about yeah, that. Exactly. Not the, yeah, absolutely. And so anything that can be done to improve safety or, you know, add information to the driver and alert them, I think is a good thing. Cool. And, you know, what's exciting for me as a storyteller in Local 4 and with Tech Time with Andrew Humphrey, whether it's researching story ideas or talking to folks like, like John, is that – and as a human being, just as, simply as a human being in the community service work that I do, is that all this work – and all this pioneering is being done right here in Detroit and Southeast yep. Michigan. Yep. And it doesn't stop with John. It also goes to future generations. So one of the great things about this conference and the work that John is doing is also letting uh, newer generations know about it. Or even generations that already are professionals but want to get into the space as well. And teaching them about it and so they can also get in on the action, get into the game, not only for themselves but also to help other people out. That's really fertile ground for a lot of storytelling ideas also. Uh, the work that John is doing and many of the other companies that are here. They're sponsoring hackathons by area schools yep. as young as middle school. Um, and they're also going out and even teaching individuals, individual students or individual, individual teachers about cyber, cyber security uh, for themselves personally, for their families, how to con conduct yourself on social media. Just the plethora of story ideas that are great, not only for storytelling like what you two do, Bob and Dave, but what anyone can do for the betterment of, uh, of other human beings. Absolutely. We send out the bat signal at least once a month that says if you're in college right now and you're majoring in philosophy or history or lib arts, <laughs> Get into IT security. You, you, you will not be disappointed. I don't. You know, even you can take it at any level you want. Yep. You can get in the weeds, or you can go high level. You know, the that philosophy of IT security. <laughs> there it is. But there is. A, but there is a nexus there. There is a connection there. I don't. At the keynote speech today, made by um, the head of uh, Radware. Uh, address a couple of those issues, like is there a right to privacy? Literally, in the U.S. Constitution, he said, there is no right to privacy. But the EU, they recently introduced that into the EU's uh, yep. Constitution. We actually we were having that conversation earlier, yeah. So those types of uh, philosophical issues or idealistic type of types of issues are not too far away from the things that all of us here are talking about. Yeah. Very true. Well, hey, we're gonna we're gonna wrap things up, John, Andrew. Really appreciate your time. This is great conversation. We'll probably talk about this for another two hours after this. Yeah, but uh, appreciate you, you guys hanging out. Any, uh, John? I guess you know you don't want to be found. That's fine. <laughs> uh, Andrew, we'll see you on Channel Four. Yeah, uh, you can get, see me on Channel Four. You can Andrew. You can go to andrewhumphrey.com for all my social media links. Uh, Andrew Local Four on Twitter. I can never have enough Twitter followers. Uh, also, always welcoming story ideas. Uh, Tech time with Andrew Humphrey. All my uh, contact information is out there either on clickondetroit.com or andrewhumphrey.com. Very cool. Very cool. Awesome. Good hanging out with you guys. Great conversation. And uh, this will wrap things up here at Secure World Detroit for the IT and the D Show. We will catch you guys. This is a previously recorded episode of the IT and the D Show. IT in the D. Networking Detroit. One beer at a time. ITinthed.com.